Hi guys, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I'm uh, Julian Lehmann, uh, the CDN uh, and Cybersecurity Manager at EaseWeb. I'm really glad to welcome you to this uh, webinar, uh, who is about uh, experiencing a DDoS attack. So we're going to do a DDoS attack simulation and see how uh, we can mitigate it in our cloud. Welcome. Uh, let me uh, remind you a few rules, uh, housekeeping rules for this webinar. It's going to be uh, recorded. A link to the recording and the slides from today's webinar will be emailed uh, to you within 24 hours. Uh, submit any question you might have during this webinar and then we'll spend time after uh, at the end of it to respond to all your questions and if any question uh, has not been able to be answered for you know, time constraints, then we'll make sure to contact you and to, uh, to answer you uh, in a later stage. And, uh, um, well, we are really glad to, uh, to have you here. The agenda of today is uh, starting with a general introduction of, you know, the, the context of the attack. I, I think you've read the news, so uh, it's uh, right on the spot, I would say. Then uh, we'll do a live demo of an uh, of, um, application layer attack and uh, we'll try to mitigate it and we'll see uh, how successful we are in that. I already, uh, you know how it goes, you know, we are not immune from uh, the, the famous demo effect, so uh, I hope everything will go fine. It's going to be a live demo and uh, we, uh, it's going to be fun, I'm pretty sure. So uh, let's uh, dive into it. Uh, no need to, <laughs> to say that, uh, you know, DDoS are really uh, on top of the headlines these days. It's really a hot topic and, uh, and uh, we've seen inc this incredible volumetric attack that brought many websites in the US uh, last week, actually. We as well uh, saw, I mean, just to name the, the most famous one, uh, 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 Yahoo, uh, that has been uh, stolen about 500 million user details uh, during the last year without even finding out. And, uh, and uh, so we see that this is, you know, this attack is really getting the headline now and uh, we should all be concerned about this because the cost of such attack is not neutral for your company. Uh, you see on this slide, you know, the, the loss of critical information is the main cost associated to, uh, to, uh, to an attack, you know, as well uh, you can consider the cost of, uh, you know, calling in emergency uh, an IT security expert uh, and, and trying to solve or the, the issue or the reputation on the company, so you see a different number that are uh, usually associated to, uh, to the cost of a, of a DDoS attack. So not only it's a technical problem, it's as well a really a, a value destruction uh, element for any company that has a presence online. Uh, just uh, let me first introduce one slide, this is the only slide I have uh, on uh, who is this web and, um, and, uh, and, you know, so that you have a, a feeling uh, of uh, who we are and uh, why we do this uh, with webinar. Uh, basically, uh, you know, we are a global company, global hosting and cloud company. Uh, we have a network of 5.5 terabit per second, 53 pops. We are managing 80,000 servers for more than the last uh, 15 years. So, you know, that gives us a bit of a legitimacy to speak about DDoS attack because we've, ex you know, we are experienced in this field and, uh, and uh, we are based in the Netherlands where I am today and the weather is actually nice, so uh, that's, uh, that's a first. And um, we uh, want to uh, take this opportunity to uh, do a live demo of a DDoS attack for you. So let me just introduce uh, just quickly the kind of attack and uh, we, of course, there are many ways to categorize attacks on the market, but if you agree, we will just uh, keep the three uh, main types of attacks that we, uh, that we have uh, uh, selected. Uh, so the first type is a volume-based attack, so uh, typically relying on a swarm of requests, usually from illegitimate IP addresses to overwhelm a website with a flood of traffic. So basically the concept is to uh, flood the pipe uh, fill in the pipe as much as we can that are reaching uh, the servers so that the, the site is not accessible anymore. So these attacks are measured in uh, bit per second and they were the one that uh, brought down uh, DIN uh, last week which as a consequence of all the customers of DIN and, uh, and 
even others went down. Uh, the second type of attack are the protocol attack. Uh, the goal of the protocol attack is to is a bit different. Instead of filling up the pipe, it's to drain the system resources. You know, by sending open requests such as TCP/IP requests with phony IPs, uh, saturating network uh, resources to the point that those resources can't transfer anymore. And today we'll do a demo of the application layer attack, uh, simulating a, a large number of HTTP requests. Uh, just before we start, let me just remind you what's a botnet. Uh, for those who uh, who don't know, is just you know, uh, as we are going to use uh, the, to, to simulate the use of one. Basically, a botnet is a number of internet computer and connected device. Um, Last week, we actually found out that you know even uh, cameras were used uh, as bot <laughs> and uh, as a, a weapon against uh, sites. Uh, that although their owner are completely unaware of it, uh, they have been set up to forward transmission, including spam, scam, hacks, DDoS, uh, to other computer on the internet. So. Uh, this is a, a very common way of attacking a uh, site uh, using a botnet. So let's uh, dive in, if you agree. Uh, and uh, let me now pass on the floor to our colleagues, uh, Leon, who will dig in details to the subject and show uh, a demo of an attack and uh, how to block it. Hi, Leon. Hey, guys. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Perfect. Julian, thank you so much. Great uh, overview of DDoS. Uh, very insightful. And um, uh, just want to introduce myself really quickly. My name is Leon Cooperman. I'm a security engineer for the Lease Web team. I'm actually uh, based in Los Angeles, mostly for the weather, not so much for the Hollywood lifestyle. Um, so Julian here, it's a little bit raining, which is very unusual. So I think we're swapping weather for the day. Um, as Julian said, we're going to get uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, with uh, an attack demo. This is going to be a fairly technical session, so for the engineers on the line, you should have a lot of fun. Uh, I'm just going to preamble with a couple of uh, bullet points. Julian uh, did a good job of explaining um, the botnet concept. Uh, I want to dive into a little bit about types of attacks and what we're going to try. We're going to try three different types um, today in varying levels of sophistication. So let me go ahead and uh, pull up the PowerPoint here for that slide. And Julian, can you just let me know if you see the, the first slide there on my side? Assuming it's OK. So um, just ping me if you, do, if you don't see the simpler dumb attacks. But um, let's start with, with the concept of uh, categorizing application layer attacks. As Julian mentioned, these are tools that are designed to bring down a website at the application layer. And so you have, um, at the onset of DDoS, uh, you know, if we go back seven, eight, ten years ago, we really had what we were called simple or dumb uh, attacks. And there's lots of tools that are available to simulate large loads for both HTTP and HTTPS requests. Um, that's not something that's new. Um, and there are a lot of what we call commercial stressors. I'm not going to publicize any of them because um, it would be doing uh, disjustice to the kind of other side of the equation, but um, I, let's let's talk about the open source tools that are available that are used legitimately for testing and loads and stress uh, testing um, uh, websites. So there are tools like JMeter, which is written in Java, Apache Benchmark, and Apache Siege are two of my favorites. And we're going to use Apache Benchmark um, as part of the demo here, just because we can start up a lot of concurrent threads uh, of execution and run some traffic against a, a web application in short order. But there are lots of commercial stressors. So you guys have seen in the news, uh, there have been various DDoS groups that have been in the news that provide what they call stressors for you know, some small number of euros per month. Um, and uh, these are typically not sophisticated uh, application layer attacks at layer 7. So, where, do the tra where does the traffic come from? Julian covered one area of traffic, which was the botnet uh, category. Right? But there's also a huge number of compromised servers out there. If you look at how easy, how many people leave their SSH or even you know, back in the day Telnet uh, ports open and brute force attacks could simply uh, compromise servers and 
bring them in as kind of part of the server army. And as you'll see, it doesn't take a lot of uh, energy or uh, uh, horsepower to actually bring down a typical web application or a website. So uh, imagine what happens when you have a botnet of 10 plus thousand IPs or 100 uh, thousand IPs uh, in a given botnet, and those are very common uh, in, in today's world, especially with the advent of IoT. Um, the, the attack that we saw several weeks back, and even on the one on Dyn, was based on a set of networks of vulnerable cameras made in China, fundamentally, that had a whole set of vulnerabilities exposed that the attackers uh, took advantage of. Cloud environments are a big a source of denial of service. In fact, many of our customers, when they put up their customer-facing applications, they say, uh, we want to block all AWS and Azure and other cloud providers because there's no business for those servers to really be talking to our public-facing application. And why, why are cloud environments being used? The cloud environments, because of the ease of setup and the ease of stand-up, uh, they're prone to these types of layer 7 attacks because, or the initiation of those layer 7 attacks because it's very easy to take a stolen credit card, uh, bring up an instance in any cloud provider you choose, uh, spin up some capacity, and la because layer 7 attacks are, are typically smaller, you don't need gigabits of capacity or gigabits of traffic to bring down a web application. You're going to see that we're going to bring it on a website with maybe under 5 megabits per second of traffic which is what's available on an average uh, home user environment. Um, and so they don't need to be large. And as a result of not being large, most cloud providers really can't pick up the activity because it's a very small amount of activity, relatively speaking. So compromised servers often participate in attacks, even without the administrative uh, knowledge, because um, they're, uh, again, it's so slow and low. And a great example of that is WordPress pingback. I'm sure you guys have all seen compromised WordPress servers. And we're going to talk a little bit about the pingback attack in the next, uh, in the next slide here. So let's talk a little bit about um, what types of mitigation strategies we've seen our customers use um, and some things that uh, we've seen work and not work very effectively. So rate limiting rarely works unless it's a very simple attack with um, just a couple of IPs. Um, you're not going to get a tremendous rate from uh, a layer 7 attack. More often than not, a strategy is to use a large number of IPs at a very slow rate, maybe only one request per second, maybe a, re a few requests every minute. Um, and uh, and so, so when folks try to turn on kind of a rate limiting strategy, um, that's typically in today's environment. It may have worked five or six years ago in today's environment. Um, rate limiting is going to be much less useful. A lot of folks also try to uh, match uh, header parameters. And, and the problem with matching header parameters, and I'll show you in the demo, is that these can easily be spoofed. If you're looking at user agents as a, as a header, um, it, you know, that's, a, that's a less than trivial to, uh, to spoof a, a user agent. So as, as mitigation strategies involved and customers uh, and enterprises have started to become serious about DDoS, they've bought various DDoS appliances or services, there are some uh, traditional challenges um, that folks will use to um, mitigate layer 7 attacks. So kind of the first and obvious one is, does the attack botnet or does the bot itself capable of handling cookies? And most browsers are capable of handling cookies. And uh, back in the day, bots uh, were very uh, stupid or dumb. And so they really weren't able to handle cookies or redirect. And even to this day, most bots uh, are not capable of handling JavaScript. So those three rudimentary kind of uh, tests or challenges, if you will, are good examples of simple ways of mitigating um, uh, layer 7 attacks. And we're going to go through that example in just a second. But back to the WordPress pingback. So WordPress pingback is a feature of WordPress that allows for some publishing features within the WordPress stack. And unfortunately, it's been used by um, attackers to compromise WordPress servers and then uh, use those compromised servers to hit a particular website and try to, it's designed to collect the content of a site for RSS feeds and others, but it can be really be used to overwhelm uh, a site. So the nice thing about WordPress pingbacks is that WordPress in its uh, design has put the 
Word WordPress into the HTTP user agent. So if you ever see that, here's a bit of you know uh, e here's an easy one for you. Um, those three lines in Nginx um, will stop a WordPress pingback attack um, just by looking at the user agent. And we see this kind of on a daily basis. These are uh, kind of the cheap attacks to launch and uh, uh, cheap to launch, easy to mitigate. Um, uh, uh, the other thing, and I thought this would be uh, just a fun one uh, on, on in the afternoon here to put up. I don't know if you've ever played Whack-A-Mole. Here in the U.S., we have this fun amusement game at Disneyland and other places called Whack-A-Mole. And um, it, it's basically a mole comes up out of the game and you ha hit it. And when I see customers trying to do this with IP addresses, I kind of shake my head because this is often a mitigation strategy that folks will use. Is, oh, we'll grab an IP address out of the logs, we'll block it in IP tables or some other firewall. So it's a fun game at Disneyland, but it's not a great mitigation strategy. And if you if you kind of see your guys uh, in the IT department doing this with IP addresses, probably time to uh, come up with a, a slightly more sophisticated strategy. So let's go ahead and do the demo. I'm just going to stop uh, the slideshow for a second. Here we go. And um, you guys should see my screen. So there's a few windows here, and let me... Um, let me just walk through what we have here. On the left side of my screen, I've got a WordPress site. Uh, it's wpdemo.leasewebsecurity.com. It's just a demo site that we've put up. And you can see that it's uh, just a very uh, simple WordPress site with some, co uh, some content. Um, and it's quite fast, and it's running on a cloud server. Uh, and on the right side, uh, we've got... Now, so just so you guys, uh, there's always one guy in the room in a webinar. So I've blocked access to this site from the outside for the purposes of this demo. Just as uh, uh, there's always one guy who wants to uh, to uh, have a demo fail, but um, you won't be able to get to this site um, during the uh, the webinar. Um, so what I've got on the left side is uh, I've got a simple htop command. Uh, this is all on the origin infrastructure. So. Um, uh, you'll see that I've got a uh, CPU monitor with memory and swap and the process list. And we're running here a uh, traditional WordPress stack. So there's going to be MySQL, uh, Apache, uh, and PHP. Fundamentally, that's the, the stack. Now, um, one of the things you're going to see is, is that PHP is a fundamentally slow framework. All application frameworks are pretty slow. So it's what makes it so easy for a DDoS attack to bring down uh, a site such as WordPress or Magento or any other um, kind of a site that's really not designed to handle tens of thousands of requests per second. Um, under the uh, um, the utilization window here, I've got just a simple window. What I'm doing is I've got a little command here to show us the, the rate of requests per second. And you're going to see that it's not a very high rate in order to bring down the server. And below here, I've got my web logs. So I'm just tailing the access logs for Apache so that you can see um, uh, what kind of traffic is coming into the environment. So again, the site is up and running uh, without any problems. And let's minimize Safari. And what you're going to see on the left side is our actual uh, attack uh, uh, environment. So I've got three, only three attack servers with three unique IPs. We're going to uh, emulate the fact that it is a much larger botnet, but we're going to only use uh, three IP addresses to do the attack. So I've got attack demo, attack demo two, and attack demo three, and they're going to do different things at different times. Okay, so that's our setup. Let's start with a very basic. So um, for our WP demo um, leasewebsecurity.com site, what I've done is in our web application firewall, all all of our demo sites today are going through our web application firewall. And I'm going to show you a user interface in just a second. But before I do that. Web, this first uh, demo site doesn't actually have any mitigation turned on. And the goal here is I want you to see that when we start the attack traffic, we're going to be um, flooding the server, and I, and I don't, wanna, I don't actually want to block anything. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm going to start um, Apache Benchmark, and um, let, me <clears throat> let me start it in one window just so that I can show you. Um, we're going to... We're going to do the first one without mitigation. And what this is doing, and you're going to see my, my screen moving, you're going to see CPU here at about you know, 20, 30 percent. Um, and, you, and you see that we're only doing about 20 requests per second here. I'm spoofing a user agent of a Mac uh, Safari browser. And I'm doing 50 concurrent threads. 
um, and I'm doing, going to do 2,000 of those requests. So you can see just one cloud server connected with a gig link is already generating 30 requests per second. Now, if I go ahead and do, so let's see what, what's happening on the site right now. If I bring up the browser and I try to pull up a page, um, it may be a slow, but it's still kind of coming up. Like, you know, the site isn't really down. So if we're a denial of service actor, we're really not achieving our goal yet. Well, let's see what happens when we start a couple more of these. Um, here we go. So you can see the logs are running. I'm not really getting any more requests per second, and that's because Apache just can't handle it. There's just not enough processes. The box is maxed out. I'm climbing on memory. And if we go back to the browser now, you'll see that the site is probably not responsive. Right? So you can see, just with three IP addresses um, and no mitigation turned on, I was able to take a pretty fast environment uh, in my WordPress demo, and I was able to bring it down. So a kind of phase one of the attack was really successful for us. So I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and stop the attack here. And let's see if the site actually recovers. Uh, that, would be, uh, that would be good if it were covered, right? Oh, no, what do we have here? We, we don't even have any database connections left to, uh, to uh, bring up the site. So this is, and if we have to, to restart databases and restart applications, that's typically not a good place to be in. I, I'm going to have to do it in this case because we, uh, what is it, MySQL. So I'm going to go ahead and restart MySQL, and let's hope that the site comes up now. Awesome, the site came up. Let's go back to get our, getting our logs in place. Okay. So what do we do about this, right? What what is our uh, what is our mitigation strategy for these quote unquote dumb attacks? We can't look at user agent. Um, other things in the request look pretty normal. So let's go to some of our challenges, right? And um, I just want to see if I have uh, any uh, notes here in the PowerPoint presentation on uh, what we want to show here. Give me one second. Yeah. One second, guys. Perfect. Okay, so let's now, I've got a second application here, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up, um, hold on one second, I'm going to bring up a window here, and this is our Leaf Web, um, web Application Firewall interface, and so for the WordPress um, uh, demo attack that we did, we have no mitigation turned on, and you can see these spikes almost everything is going directly to the origin. And we have a logging interface on, uh, here that actually shows uh, all of the um, uh, requests that came in. And you can actually see that the, there is the spoofed user agent and the IP address that I'm coming for, from and so on. Now, what I want to do is I want to switch to a second demo that we have, which is WP Demo 2. And let's go ahead and bring that uh, into the browser. And it's got a slightly different configuration. It has a configuration under DDoS policies. Here you'll see we've got um, some basic mitigation turned on in block mode. So first of all, I want to bring that up in the browser. Let's see if we can make sure that we can browse the site correctly and it's not affecting human beings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch here to WP Demo 2. And we can see that WP Demo 2 is coming up just fine for me in Safari on my mobile browser um, and in other, in other human what we call human environments. So now what we want to do is let's launch that same attack now that we have a blocking mode turned on for denial of service. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm going to just minimize the WAF here for a second. And we're going to do the exact same attack that we did, which is still what we consider a pretty unintelligent attack. Um, and we're going to do that here uh, across all three environments. Now, watch the CPU of our origin server 
and watch what happens when, watch how quickly Apache Benchmark is completing here. So our server took a little bit of stress, but uh, we did the exact same attack against um, our, our second demo environment with mitigation turned on, and the site is just fine. I'm going to do that. I'm going to launch it again, um, and I'm going to have the browser up at the same time, just so that you guys can see what the response time is. It's it's actually mitigating a little fast, but you can see that there's absolutely no effect to the website when that happens. So why is that? Let's take a look again at um, the WAF environment, and you can see that I've got um, a configuration that says after 10 requests, um, if we believe that there is a bot based on some what we call JavaScript challenge or some basic um, uh, testing of the browser, we're going to block the IP address in question for 60 seconds. And in this case, I've set to a response code of uh, 403, so which means we're not going to show a very nice response to those block bots, but we probably don't need to. And then if we look at the logs here, and again, this is all in the WAF interface, and we are going let's, to let's limit this by um, just the caching logs for now, which is basically your access logs. You'll see that all of these requests from this particular IP were blocked with uh, 403. And there are some other really cool dashboards that you can look at um, in the environment. You'll see, the, um, you'll see that the top user agent that we've blocked, the top IP addresses that we're blocking, and you'll see if there's a lot of blocking going on over time, you'll see this chart um, kind of... Uh, um, show that hist historically or a histogram. Okay. So um, hopefully that gives you kind of an idea of how we mitigate uh, pretty simple attacks, uh, which is 90% of the internet today, or 90% of the DDoS world today, with commercially available stressors and uh, open source uh, tools. But um, what happens when the attack is a little bit more intelligent? And that's what we're going to talk about kind of next. So I'm going to bring up uh, the intelligent attack slide, and let's Let's uh, take it from there. Okay. Awesome. So intelligent attacks. So a very small percentage of attacks uh, are targeted. So the, the threat actor that is uh, after a website that wants to get bring it down is actually scripting and building something specifically to bring down that site. So botnets and compromised servers can easily spoof user agent headers. Um, they'll use a vast number of IPs. We talked about this in a very low request rate. And they're capable of getting and setting session cookies. They're capable of following JavaScript um, uh, uh, redirects. And they're capable of um, creating mixed content requests. So um, pulling up the home page, the search page, the product page, help pages, and so forth. And they're also capable of sending mixed get and post methods. Really. So there's no signature that you can really pull up that will um, that will create a uh, signature that will catch the particular bots that you're looking at when the bots are intelligent. So one of the things that we've noticed in the industry is now um, there are tools that are fully capable of JavaScript and DOM manipulation, which means that there's a real browser behind, behind the bot, and there's no user interface. It's what we call a headless browser. And there are many such toolkits out there. And we don't have time to cover all of them, but I do want to cover kind of one that we've been working with for a while. It's called PhantomJS, and here's the URL. Now, PhantomJS is a testing tool, and it has completely legit legitimate purposes, and you want to automate your, the testing of your web application, to, and, and that includes JavaScript functionality. This is a great framework. And then there are other testing frameworks that are built on top of Phantom as a toolkit. And many frameworks now support full browser JavaScript execution. And our concern from a DDoS industry perspective is when do these tools become weaponized? In other words, when do these DLLs or shared objects kind of become part of the malware that gets delivered to end user um, desktops and IoT devices and compromised servers and so that uh, full JavaScript can be run in, in a headless environment? PhantomJS is pretty mature, and it's been widely used in the QA and testing industry for a long time. But you can see here I've got 40 lines of code that will let me run an uh, indefinite number of um, uh, indefinite number of requests against the website. So let's take a look at what happens when we do that against, let's go back into our demo environment and run this particular script. 
against uh, WordPress Demo 2, which has absolutely no mitigation uh, against, well, it has mitigation turned on, but um, let's see how it reacts to a fully functional JavaScript bot. So um, you guys should see my uh, demo screen again. Um, and let's go ahead and pull up. I'm going to maximize uh, just uh, one of the attack. We're not going to use all three attack windows um, because this is going to be a point to show you that the requests are actually making through. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up um, Phantom JS, and we're going to run it against um, the second instance, which has mitigation turned on. Here. Okay. So let me just get. Let me just see where our Phantom is. All right. Awesome. So we're going to go ahead, and I have this scripted against um, WordPress Demo 2, again, which is mitigation turned on. And you, you guys saw that it successfully stopped the, um, the dumb attack or the non-intelligent attack, if you will. So here we go. We're going to do 100 runs. And I'm just outputting the cookies that we're receiving and all of the active mitigation challenges. And you can see that. Phantom is doing a great job at running without impediment. So we're basically not stopping um, this attack with uh, basic redirects, cookies, JavaScript challenges. Um, we were able to, in 40 lines of script, basically blow up you know, what the majority of the denial of service world uses um, as a mitigation. So, and I just put demo2 as the user agent so that we can see that we're getting these requests through. So how do we mitigate against these um, more uh, sophisticated attacks? Well, the answer, and I'm going to show you this in the kind of our, one of our last slides here, is we need to really leverage behavioral analysis and some advanced analytics capabilities. We need to know that there's a human being at the end. And this is kind of an escalating war of mimicking human behavior versus um, uh, trying to find out and root out what that mimic is actually doing. So, And we're going to be continuing this kind of back and forth with attackers for a long time. It requires an active research and development team and an active security operations um, and a security intelligence team to really understand the threats in the landscape out there. But let's go ahead and see what happens when we run this against Demo 3. And just to give you guys an example of Demo 3 here, I'm going to pull that up in Safari. And Demo 3 is the exact same thing as Demo 2 and Demo, except it has advanced mitigation turned on. And advanced mitigation, in this case, means behavioral analysis. Right? So um, when I open this page in, um, in, in a browser, uh, I have uh, absolutely no problem looking through, refreshing the page. Uh, even at a high rate, um, there's no impediment to um, this particular to the browser itself. But let's see what happens when we try to get PhantomJS to do the same thing, again, with all of those same capabilities. So let's go ahead and do that. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just clear the screen. And one important thing to notice is we've got the mitigation platform set to testing the, uh, the browser or the bot with a series of 10 requests. So we'll make a determination after 10 requests. And what you should see on the right side of the screen is that we're not going to get a significant, we're not going to get all 100 requests come through. At some point, behavior analysis will pick up and say, you know, this is definitely not a human being. So let's see how that works. So we're, again, we're going to run 100. Now, look what happened here. On my right side in my logs, I saw 10 requests come through on demo three, human interaction. But I ran 100 requests here. So where did the rest of those requests go? And we could run this again just so that you can see. At this point, the IP address has been flagged as a bot. And we're not going to accept any connections to it um, for a timeout period. And I think I, I set the timeout for 60 seconds again. So you have absolutely, even with an intelligent attack, you have absolutely no stress on the origin infrastructure or our web server. And, and let's go back to the browser. Is the browser OK? Are we still able to browse the site without any problems? Of course we are, and you can see that that content is being served correctly. So just the, as the last piece of this demo, what I want to do is I want to bring up the web application firewall. And let's switch to the WordPress Demo 3 um, site. And I'm just going to show you where that advanced mitigation is set. 
So under our web application firewall policies, we have a lot of different web application firewall rules. But I've, most of them are turned off for the purpose of this demo. But I have a custom web application firewall rule called the least web human behavioral challenge. And I've got it set in blocking mode. And we have it set so that this uh, web application firewall rule will use hand requests to determine malicious activity or not. So once again, let's go back to the logs that are available within that least web environment. And let's go ahead and look at the last logs, because that's what's going to tell us why we're blocking. And so right now, you see that I've got a whole bunch of blocks um, right around the time, a couple of minutes back. And if we open the block itself, we'll see that that user agent is demo3, which is what exactly why, uh, is exactly the traffic that we sent. And the human interaction challenge has failed on this IP with this particular user agent. And that's why we, d we saw a deny on uh, uh, with the HTTP response code of 403. So that kind of brings us full circle to that um, uh, full mitigation uh, capability, even under advanced circumstances. And I just have one more kind of slide to talk about some of the advanced uh, capabilities that the platform has. So I'm just going to play here. And that was our Phantom JS attack de demo and mitigation. So again, back to just to just to recap, mitigation of complex layer seven attacks. The least web WAF leverages many advanced mitigation techniques. Um, to, uh, we just showed you one today, which was the human interaction and or the behavioral analysis challenge. Uh, we have a JavaScript challenge for testing browser capabilities. It will capture the vast majority of simple and most common attacks. Um, that feature is available both in the pro, uh, in the express and enterprise, or the pro and enterprise feature. Um, we have the human interaction challenge. This is available in the enterprise platform only, and that leverages behavioral analysis in, re in real time to detect human activity. And then we have something called a device fingerprint challenge, which we didn't show you today. Um, but this is a, a challenge that uniquely fingerprints devices and their behavior. And it's unique because it's capable of catching an entire botnet in one shot. So if you have 10,000 IPs coming at you at a slow rate, um, this is the type of mitigation challenge we would turn on to try to uh, catch the bot is the term that we use. Okay. So um, that's it for the demo. Julian, can I pass uh, the mic back to you? Hi, Leon. That was great. Great presentation. Great demo. Thank you very much. I hope with this, we've been able to, to sensibilize many of our audience about cybersecurity risk and, uh, and mitigation solutions at hand. Um, of course, uh, it's important to mention uh, that uh, you know within this web, uh, the security doesn't come at the expense of uh, speed. So that's why we uh, you know we've chosen uh, to rely on a distributed solution. So all the WAF. Uh, platform that we have implemented for uh, all these web customers and uh, anyone <laughs> you know who needs to to be uh, protecting his website are uh, these webs are distributed globally on the map that I showed you in the introduction. So uh, security does not come at the expense of uh, of speed. And other element to take in account in a in a decision, of course, would be the reliability. The, we've seen the convenience of the solution as well as. Uh, its ability to be customized for uh, for any environment, and um, you know we know that each website is different, and that's why there is these rules, and uh, we have like more than 300 rules that we've implemented in order to really adapt and customize the solution to each environment. Let me uh, end this with one quote. Uh, one of our customers uh, in the advertisement business. Uh, advertisement, you know, it's all about speed and they deal with, uh, you know, more than 100,000 uh, legitimate requests uh, globally and uh, they made the choice to uh, to trust uh, our service to uh, protect them from uh, from attack because the uh, impact on their revenue was uh, very high and uh, and we've been able to, we are able to screen through all those requests and only allow the legitimate one and block all the illegitimate one. So, uh, thank you very much. Stay tuned as uh, we'll be preparing another webinar for in a couple of months, maybe uh, before the end of the year, if we are lucky uh, and organized enough on uh, how to protect uh, your API traffic. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. 
we've been very glad to be with you. I think we, it's been a really interesting demo today. And uh, what I propose, uh, I hope you found it useful. And what I propose now is that we move on to the question part. Uh, please enter your question, and uh, we're going to unmute as well uh, Leon. So Leon, if you want, we can, uh, we can speak together on this. And what I will do, I will read the questions uh, as I see them appearing, and then uh, we'll be answering you uh, together. That's okay with you, Leon? Absolutely. Okay. So uh, let me start. Uh, first, uh, w w the first question I see is why did the database stop during the demo? Great question. So the database stopped because the typically databases have what's called a connection pool associated with a web application server and you'll have a certain number of uh, connections available. So in our case, we flooded um, the, the application with 150 concurrent requests. Not all of them were being processed simultaneously, obviously, and the database simply didn't have enough connections in its pool to service all of those requests. No matter how high you set that watermark, someone will be able to break it. So uh, expanding your connection pool size is not a great strategy for uh, mitigation. As you can, and as you saw, the, the site was, uh, no longer responsive, uh, even to serve a basic request from a browser. Thanks. Uh, the next question is uh, about OSEC. Uh, OSEC is used to, uh, you know, to, to block the, the, uh, the IPs in the IP table. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of that, uh, Leon, uh, OSEC, uh, to, to block IPs. And the question is, uh, is even this uh, a useless strategy to you know, to block each IP, IP per IP, as we discover them illegitimate. Yeah, I, I guess the problem with IP level blocking is that you have to get those IPs from somewhere. So, if you have a threat intelligence feed where you're, um, where you're get, where, you know, where you're sharing in a community and you have potentially um, malicious IP addresses, um, that is one strategy to use, um, and you can put. Um, stuff into IP tables. We actually have a great uh, open source a tool that we um, we published at LeaseWeb that allows you to uh, publish large quantities of IPs uh, uh, in um, IP tables even behind a load balancer, which has traditionally been a problem in the industry. But again, you have no idea if the IP is legitimate, not legitimate. You need to have an ability to test in real time, um, and static IP lists are just not going to give that for you. It's, it's a combination of high false negatives, which means you're just not going to get catch the batch guys, and then a set of false positives on the other side, meaning you're going to be blocking legitimate IPs as well. Uh, the other question is, is uh, this service available for virtual servers as well? Absolutely. We don't discriminate as to what type of, it's not, there's no software that you have to install on your servers, guys. So um, this is all cloud-based. You simply, provi the provisioning takes five minutes. You provision this in the cloud, um, and then you create some access control rules you know, to only accept traffic from LeaseWeb. And at that point, we will. So you're blocking out the rest of the world. And at that point, all traffic funnels through our cloud, uh, and we're filtering it in real time. And then a, a, another uh, question is: um, Are uh, those services uh, only available for servers hosted with LeaseWeb? Uh, like, uh, you know, website or bare metal, or uh, is it as well available to protect a website hosted outside this? Do you want to take that one, Julian? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean the answer is easy. So uh, as it's uh, domain-based and the application layer attack, we are able to protect uh, uh, any domain, uh, even though it's we don't, we, we don't recommend it, you know, but even though it's hosted outside this web. So, any website actually can benefit from this cybersecurity uh, domain protection service. Uh, it's not required to be uh, hosted with this web. Um, the next one is um, uh, how is exactly the intelligent de detection works to detect uh, the phantom GS attack? Those initial 10 requests are analyzed against some previous data with an interrogation mark. So that's kind of the secret sauce, guys, um, where there's uh, a lot of research and development went into understanding uh, human behavior. Um, one of the things that we didn't have time to talk about on this um, uh, webinar is uh, CAPTCHA, and I, I would have really have liked to have covered that. Maybe we'll leave it for the next topic. 
um, but um, CAPTCHA is essentially uh, what's called a reverse Turing test and it's designed to analyze or create a challenge to test human whether someone on the other end of a black box is human or not. And that's fundamentally the research we've been doing for the last two and a half years is how do we create an intelligent way to detect human behavior um, that lends itself to clickstream analysis, it lends itself to device fingerprinting and many other criteria that are part of the machine learning model. So I have another question, it's a long question, thanks Leon, uh, let me continue with that. So can you give, so it's around the same, uh, the same question, so, uh, but still let me, let me ask again, so give some example of how behavior analysis is made and then he is asking a specific uh, context. So if my web application sends AJAX requests every second from each visitor, will your behavior analysis ban legal visitors? And if no, can the, the attacker slowly train anti-DDoS system to accept malicious requests? Sure. So can an attacker work around behavioral analysis? Uh, there are a lot of smart people in this world, so to say a system is bulletproof is foolish. Of course, attackers will um, escalate their level of capability. We're seeing attackers that are well-funded, well-educated, extremely smart folks on the other end of the system that are getting paid well to do what they do. The, the, the platform that we're trying to provide is something that will stop uh, attacks for the vast majority of our customers. And when there is a targeted attack, that's when our security operations team gets involved. So that's when the expertise of uh, blocking DDoS for the last 10 plus years uh, comes into play. Uh, will we be able to stock 100% of attacks through this um, uh, technology? No, we won't. Although I haven't seen a commercialized bot that is able to defeat um, our algorithms today, that doesn't mean it won't happen tomorrow. So again, it's an escalating um, uh, battle, if, if you will. To answer your question on Ajax, we do have customers that are using Ajax. Um, and it lends itself a little bit to the API discussion, because one of the, the, the next questions you guys might want to ask is, well, I have a mobile application that's talking HTTP, just like a bot. Uh, how would you distinguish? So we have a whole different module for API protection, um, which we want to talk about. Um, not don't have time today to discuss it, um, but hopefully that brings you guys back for the next demo. Another question is that uh, you did a demo with only uh, one IP, or actually a couple IPs that were attacking the, the, the website. If the attack would cycle quickly through many different IPs, and you keep, you keep a timeout of only 60 seconds, well, we could potentially overcome the challenges uh, you showed, uh, except for the fingerprint challenge. Right. Great, great question. So I've, put, I've set the threshold low so that we can reset, so we don't have to wait. 30 minutes, 60 minutes, you can set that threshold to be whatever you want. So in production, we have customers that have IPs blocked for hours uh, um, if they don't want to see them again after a challenge. The other thing we have is what's called escalation to CAPTCHA, which we didn't show, but this gives you the ability to say, if an IP is suspected before we block them, let's get the, the user to solve a CAPTCHA, and then that um, lends itself to uh, whitelisting that IP for a period of time as well. And then the last piece is if I cycle through uh, tens of thousands of IPs uh, at a very low rate, um, as, remember we need to see a small number of, of requests to get an idea of analysis. And the reason behind that is, it, the math behind it is, when you look at your average click trail for a web application, there aren't, um, a session is pretty short in general, usually three to four minutes for the average website, and we don't need a lot of clicks to understand uh, human activity. So within the first kind of 10 requests, um, we will, in this particular case, we will kind of be able to make a judgment call. Now, if there are tens of thousands of these IPs, we need to use device fingerprint challenge, which is a slightly different mitigation technique, which we didn't talk about, um, which we didn't demo in, in today. That's probably, Julian, another thing that we can demo uh, in a future session. Yes, absolutely, I agree. Uh, I have one uh, last question, or I mean, among the last question, because we're approaching the end, but one uh, person is, is asking as well, could you mention what's unique about our capability uh, against competition? And he's naming uh, InCapture and Cloudflare. Uh, I'm, I think that, you know, I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I think you've seen already the intelligence that we put in detecting the attack and blocking the intelligent attack in, uh, in the solution that we provide. Uh, we are, uh, you know, we, we, we 
I think we can mention as well, I mean, clearly against Cloudflare, the level of customization that we provide is really incomparable to uh, what's available on, you know, with a, with a, you know, a vanilla uh, provider like, like Cloudflare. So I think that could be uh, one element to, to distinguish us from, from competition. And uh, Jillian, if I could just jump in there because I get asked this question all the time. I, I, Cloudflare is a fantastic company, and for the market that they're serving, they're doing an amazing job. And you know, I think the world would be worse off without a Cloudflare. Uh, and Capsule does a great job as well. We serve a slightly different market, and as Jillian mentioned, it's the level of control and customization that we want to give our customers. Um, yeah. And so there's a purpose for every type of tool. Um, we looked at a stressor recently. A customer was testing in a kind of uh, simulated environment. They wanted to make sure they were ready for their season. Um, and the stressor actually had an interesting option, uh, Cloudflare uh, mitigation buster. So they've already built <laughs> algorithms that have kind of worked around the, the, the Cloudflare environment. And because they're serving millions of customers, they just don't have the time or uh, ability to dedicate to um, a, a group of customers that have some pretty unique requirements. I have a, 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 a very good question as well. So. Uh, how do you mitigate against the style of attack that affected Dean last week? Great question. So, um, so Dyn is a volumetric attack, and LeaseWeb has a, a, a very high capacity platform. Um, we protect uh, a lot of DNS providers on our network, on the LeaseWeb network. Um, there are a lot of different strategies, but in the particular case of Dyn, um, I believe this was an extension of the same botnet that we saw a few weeks back. And that was a TC, what was called a TCP uh, out-of-state packet attack. So there was a, an ACK before a SIN. Uh, anyway, in technical terms, DNS does not need TCP to function. It really needs UDP. So our mitigation strategy, and we reached out to Dyn and offered our support and suggestions, would be to block TCP all the way upstream so that uh, even the volume of attack would never actually reach Dyn in, in their data center. Um, so that's kind of the short answer. I, there's a lot of technical detail that we probably don't have time to go into. It's probably the subject of a PhD thesis at some point. And one more question, uh, Leon. Uh, what about privacy, if all traffic goes through these web mitigation servers? Great question. So first, we, one thing that we probably didn't mention, Julian, is that the entire platform is level one PCI DSS compliant, which means yeah. that we adhere to a very strict set of standards uh, for the security of the cloud platform itself. We go through an and annual we, audit. And we, support, and we support HTTPS traffic as well. So whether it's HTTPS, it's, it can be certified as well. So, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Now, we do terminate HTTPS on our edge, and we re-encrypt the traffic back to the origin. The only thing that we store is header and metadata information on the transactions. We don't store the bulk of the transaction. So we don't do deep packet inspection, if you will, from a, a request perspective. Uh, so we have many large organizations, including financial institutions, that are running our web application firewall today. And in the case where there are um, specific requirements around uh, laws, regulations, that don't allow enterprises to give up the control of their HTTPS keys to a cloud provider, um, we have different deployment options that allow you to deploy the WAF within your virtual environment or your physical environment as well. Exactly. Last one, the last one I can see, and, and I don't know the answer. Uh, are we PCI compliant or PCI certified? Uh, maybe we can come back to, to this question. Uh, I think we're, we're compliant. We, have, we deliver an attestation of compliance to our customers on an annual basis. OK, OK. OK, guys, I don't see any other question. Uh, really, thank you very much for your attention. It's been a long webinar, a one hour uh, sharp. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us, for uh, participating so much, for asking so many uh, smart questions. Uh, we'll be glad to be back with you in a couple of months, and uh, we hope you liked it. Thank you. Cheers.